are we people who are really wrong? I mean, is sin real? And what is sin anyway? And we'll talk about that today. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hembert. I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV as we go through the Bible in one year from Genesis to Revelation. And today we are studying Leviticus chapter 18 to 21 with our teaching emphasis on chapter 20. It's going to be a good one. Corey is here. What's up, Corey? I'm also going to be focusing in on the first few chapters of chap uh, first few verses, I should say, of chapter 20, where it talks about the issue of child sacrifice. Ryan, what are you looking at today? Well, today I'm looking at one of God's laws in Leviticus that seems to pertain to the prophet Hosea and some accusations brought against him. Hosea the prophet. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. I look forward to those pieces. Janice, what are you doing? Jesus said the truth will set you free. And free indeed. We'll talk about that. Let's get our Bible out, open it up, and let's look at what God is saying to us now. Leviticus 20, verses 1 through 8. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Again you shall say to the children of Israel, Whoever of the children of Israel, or of the strangers who dwell in Israel, who gives any of his descendants to Molech, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. I will set my face against that man and will cut him off from his people because he has given some of his descendants to Molech to defile my sanctuary and profane my holy name. And if the people of the land should in any way hide their eyes from the man when he gives some of his descendants to Molech and they do not kill him, then I will set my face against that man and against his family and I will cut him off from his people and all who prostitute themselves with him to commit harlotry with Molech. And the person who turns to mediums and familiar spirits to prostitute himself with them, I will set my face against that person and cut him off from his people. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am the Lord your God and you shall keep my statutes and perform them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Leviticus chapter 20, verses 1 through 8. When we read Leviticus 18 to 21, this is absolutely fascinating. I say that in a most delightful way because there's a lot of details here. You know, a lot of people don't look at reading Leviticus, but wait a minute, when we do, we learn much about what Jesus Christ did and how God thinks. And so we focus today on chapter 20. God spoke to Moses and God said, speak to my people, the nation of Israel. Now at this point in scripture, we've already seen that God takes his relationships very seriously. He doesn't just have casual relationship. He takes them seriously. And there had been a great cost for God's people to be set free from Egypt, a cost that Pharaoh had forced his people to pay. Now, Pharaoh could have simply done what God said. He had been given many opportunities to do so, but instead he chooses the strenuous way. Now, let me say it again. God takes his relationships with Israel very seriously. Unfortunately, when Israel finally gained their freedom, they seemed to assume that they could do whatever they wanted. And that is sin against God had no effect on them. Well, that's not correct. Sin affects all of us, even today. God gave punishments to his people to show them that there is a right way and there is a wrong way to live. Now, most people focus in the Bible on the punishment of God, the cost of sin. But the truth is that we are ones who decide to sin or to live righteously. To sin or to live righteously. We decide that. Now this is part of the amazing message of Jesus Christ. He made us a way to come to him so that when we do sin, he will forgive us and, and help us on our walk. That's the idea. 
When we say, Jesus Christ, help me, that's what we're saying. And this gets very interesting as we focus on this today. Now, as we look at this, I find it fascinating that God begins to speak through these detailed pictures in the book of Leviticus when the law is broken. And that's what we talk about today. Turn to it in page, uh, it's the second day of February. Turn on that page and I'll tell you, this is the way to do it. If you don't have a Bible guide, you can write for yours or you can go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com and click on it and it'll take you to a page where it says donate. And thank you so much for your donations. Let me say that uh, many people have given to us uh, and, and we just thank you for it. We don't spend a lot of time raising money or doing anything like that, but we understand that God touches you and God helps us. So write for yours today. It'll take you to a PDF file when you click on it and uh, you can get it that way as well. Now, as we focus on this, let's pray. Father, help us today. We're going to open up your word. And as we look at this Leviticus chapter 20, I find this fascinating that we need to understand what you're saying to us. So help us today in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen and amen. Now, look at Leviticus chapter 20, the first three verses. This is really something. Now, let's get our mind wrapped into this so we understand. Don't, don't listen to what everything else says. Listen to what the Bible is telling you. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Again, you shall say to the children of Israel, say to the children of Israel, the children of Jacob and Israel, whoever of the children of Israel or the strangers who dwell in Israel, who gives any of his descendants to Molech, that's a God. That's a God they worshiped back then, which they were commanded not to. He shall surely be put to death. That's a serious price to pay. And let me tell you, the people of the land shall stone him with stones. Verse three, I will set my face against that man and I will cut him off from his people because he has given some of his descendants to Molech to defile my sanctuary and profane my holy name, God says. So what are we to think about this? Well, when you sacrifice a child, God proclaimed death to anyone who gave to Molech because of that. God does not kill children. The worship of Molech is involved with sacrificing babies and children through a horrible death. God is the one who gives us life. We did not give life to our sons. We did not give life to our daughters. We give life only as God has given to us through the spirit of the, of the holy God, beloved. God is the one who gives the spirit of life. And we are used in that process. But we don't grant life. God grants the life. The spirit is given by God above. That's what the scripture says. And we'll get to that later in the year. So we need to think about that because everything else we tend to learn tells us, well, we're accidents from nature. We're not accidents from nature. We're designed and created by God. Jeremiah 1.5, before I formed you in the womb, Jeremiah, I knew you and I ordained you before I formed you in the womb, a prophet unto the nations. Very important. Now let's go on. Chapter 20, verse four. And if the people of the land should in any way hide their eyes from the man when he gives some of his descendants to Molech, so if you do it secretly, and they do not kill him, then I will set my face against that man and against his family. And I will cut him off from his people. And he who prostituted themselves with him to commit harlotry with Molech. And the person who turns to mediums and familiar spirits to a prostitute or to prostitute himself with them. Look at that term, to prostitute himself with them. I will set my face against that person and cut him off from his people. What does this mean? God's people must pay attention to sin. Turn the other cheek does not mean we ignore sin. Listen to me carefully. A lot of people say, well, turn the other cheek. Yeah, turn the other cheek, but you don't ignore sin. As a Christian, when you are in a church, God's people is in the church. You don't ignore that sin. You have to pray about it and deal with this carefully. Leviticus 27 and 8. 
Consecrate yourselves therefore and be holy for I am the Lord your God and you shall keep my statutes and perform them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Okay, it's God who does that. God's people must live holy lives before him. It is only by giving our lives to follow Jesus Christ that we can be holy, beloved. He paid the cost of our sin. Now listen to me carefully. Galatians chapter six has a great passage here. And it says, if anyone is caught or troubled in sin, go and gently correct them. It says, you don't ignore it. You don't walk away from it. You don't, you get involved and you go, you go in and, and you help them gently, lest you too shall be tempted by the same thing. So God doesn't say go in and pound them. He doesn't say that. Go in and embarrass them in front of the church. He just doesn't say that. It says gently correct them. So pastors, leaders in the church, church people, listen carefully. God desires us to look out for each other. God desires us to watch out for each other. We're not simply to live alone in our houses and isolate ourselves, but we are to look after each other and pay attention to each other because that's what the Lord says. Well, it's time now to continue on with our Bible study. And today we read Leviticus chapters 18 to 21. But I'm actually going to be talking about the prophet Hosea because there's a law in Leviticus chapter 21 that some think pertains to him. The law is found in Leviticus 21 verses 7 and 14, and it forbids the marrying of a prostitute. Of course, this is exactly what Hosea did. And he did it because God commanded him to. So the major question is, if God is if God broke his own Levitical law, Check it out. It's no secret that the Bible contains many strange and shocking things, and God's command to the prophet Hosea is no exception. In fact, in Hosea's inaugural vision from the Lord, God commands him, Go, take yourself a wife of harlotry and children of harlotry, for the land has committed great harlotry by departing from the Lord. So Hosea went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, as wife, and she bore three children. This highly controversial portion of scripture clearly raises some questions and concerns. Mostly, how could a holy and righteous God break his own law by ordering Hosea to first of all marry a prostitute, and secondly, by doing so, commit adultery? Various scholars have proposed various solutions. For example, some prefer not to take this passage literally, but instead allegorically, meaning Gomer wasn't really a physical prostitute at all, only a spiritual one. However, others preferring to take the text literally suggest that Gomer became a harlot only after she had married Hosea. In this scenario, the Lord was commanding the prophet to marry a woman who God knew would be promiscuous later. Still, other scholars have no issue in taking the text both literally and at face value, pointing out that even if Gomer was a harlot previous to her marriage to Hosea, there is no problem, since none of God's laws were being violated in the first place. First of all, according to Leviticus chapter 21, verses 7 and 14, it was only unlawful for a priest to marry a harlot. And secondly, Hosea did not commit adultery by marrying a harlot, because she was an unmarried woman. It is an unusual command to be sure, but it does not require Hosea to commit adultery, nor does it endorse the past or future adultery of Gomer. Even when Gomer is unfaithful to Hosea, God commands Hosea to love her and take her back. And that is exactly the point. Hosea's unhappy marriage was intended by God to serve as a heartrending illustration of the relationship between God and Israel. Though Israel, like Gomer, committed great harlotry by serving other gods, God still loved her and will take her back. Now, personally, I have no problem taking this Hosea passage straight up. 
I know it can be shocking and offensive to us, but remember that God did stuff like this with his prophets all the time. I mean, remember when he commanded Isaiah to walk around naked for a time? Or when he asked Jeremiah to take a really long trip just to bury something and then go back and unbury it? Or how about when he asked Ezekiel to lay on his side for 430 days? You know, all of these were illustrations or pictures of what God was doing. God was making a point, and it's no different with Hosea. But again, none of the Mosaic laws were broken since only priests were forbidden to marry prostitutes. And you know something else? This isn't the first time skeptics have accused God of breaking his own law. I remember when Jesus let the woman go who was caught in adultery. Many actually think that Jesus broke the Mosaic law there. But actually, if you read the passage very closely, you'll find that he followed it right to the letter. In fact, Jesus Christ demonstrated something the law could not. Mm -hmm. He demonstrated the, the idea of mercy and the idea of showing people what it means to forgive. Yeah, absolutely. And that becomes important because the one who could throw the stone didn't. didn't. Exactly. So, you know, that's fascinating. Very, very interesting. <laughs> Thank you for that, Ryan. Okay, Corey, what's up? Well, today I'm looking at what is really a gruesome topic. We're going to be focusing in on Leviticus 20 verses 1 through 5 that where God specifically prohibits child sacrifice, in this case to the false god Molech. So it was a really common practice at that time for it to be specifically mentioned. But interestingly, it's not just the practice of child sacrifice that God condemns. He condemned any one of his people who would turn a blind eye to the practice going on in Israel as well. So there is a zero tolerance policy here. So right now you and I are going to be looking at the uh, practice of ancient child sacrifice and some of the archeological evidence for it. Take a look. The issue of human child sacrifice is brought up early on in the Bible. In the books of Leviticus and Deuteronomy, God specifically outlaws child sacrifice three times. In Leviticus 18, the practice is interestingly listed among the sexual sins, sins that are against God's purposes for the family. In Leviticus 20, it's listed in the religious sins, sins that are against God's nature and seen as religious adultery or cheating. And in Deuteronomy 12, it's given as an example to show how terrible the cultures living in Canaan were. They even did what should be unthinkable, killing children for their own advantage. And that is what history reveals as a main goal of child sacrifice, to get a spiritual advantage or favor. Greek historians writing in the 3rd to 1st centuries BC speak of child sacrifice having been brought to them in ancient times by the Phoenicians that it was utilized to try and secure the favor of a god. A vow would be made, if you do this for me, I will sacrifice my child. And then the child would be sacrificed as a show of good faith. Although sometimes the child was sacrificed after the god had given the favor. Mass child sacrifice could also be employed if the city faced something on a broad scale, like defeat in battle. The historians also hint at loopholes, how the wealthy had been known to purchase children from the poor to sacrifice, or how some used child sacrifice to get rid of unwanted children or children with disabilities. The method of sacrifice is described as placing the children on a statue of a god with sloped arms, off of which the child would roll into a pit of fire, while music was played to drown out any crying although it is unclear whether the children were first slaughtered and then burned, or if the method of death itself was the pit of fire. This bears striking resemblance to the biblical descriptions of Canaanite child sacrifice to Molech as passing children through the fire. In 1921, the largest child sacrifice burial ground so far was discovered, containing the cremated remains of over 20,000 children, ranging in age from newborn to six years old. You know, I think a lot of our reactions when we're reading through the Old Testament because of our modern culture, we read this and it's shocking to us. How could people offer already living children, living and breathing children who you've already begun to raise? How could you kill these children? But you know, it doesn't do us any good to pretend like the potential for evil isn't inside 
us already. Even in Christians, that potential for evil and evil itself does exist in every single human. We see it demonstrated in history over and over and over again. And I'm sure if you sit down, I know if I sit down and I take a really good hard look at my life and, and, and self-reflect, I see evil in my own life that I've had to deal with, you know, with God. Not this particular evil, of course, but evil nonetheless. We don't do ourselves any favor by pretending that just because we become Christians, it means our potential for sin is diminished. That is not the case. And and um, thinking that actually opens us up, I think, to, you know, if we're being unrealistic about our potential to sin, that opens us up to sin because we're not on our guard against it. We're supposed to be running the race well, to use some language from the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. We're supposed to be really careful and be guarding our hearts, you know, with all diligence. Uh, so, this is a really disturbing issue to look into in the Old Testament, but you know, the Bible doesn't pretend that evil doesn't exist and it doesn't pretend that human nature isn't sinful and neither should we. We should um, be open, really open and really honest with ourselves and with other trusted people in our lives about what's going on in our lives because that's how we will get out of sin by confessing it to each other and praying to God so that he can heal us. And if you want to learn more about that, read the book of James in the New Testament. And really, that's where I was going with my segment as well, when I said that Jesus said the truth will set you free. Mm -hmm. Because if you if you look through here, and, and uh, today we focused in on Leviticus chapter 20, which is titled Penalties for Breaking the Law. And you see here written in black and white, for the Israelites, God was setting in motion rules and and, and, and ways of living that had consequences mm -hmm. if you broke outside of that. And what he was trying to do was establish a better way of living, mm -hmm. the right way of living, a following after God. But when you get to verse 7, God says, Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. Mm -hmm. And some would say, yes, but Janice, this is the Old Testament. We're living in the New. So your point is well taken. When we consecrate ourselves or when we say, I choose yeah. to follow Jesus Christ with my life, I am relinquishing my rights as my own self and I'm choosing because I believe with 100% of my heart that Christ died for me, mm -hmm. that he paid for the cost of my sin. He literally released me. Mm -hmm. I was bondage, in bondage of sin, but he paid that price for me. So I am indebted mm -hmm. my life. I've given it to him because ultimately he paid that cost yeah. for me. So now I can't just live how I want to live. I need to follow after Christ. And your point is well taken by quoting the New Testament. Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, mm -hmm. and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. If you have chosen to give your life to Jesus Christ, then we live for God, and we must know Him, and we must know His Word. And that's not just leaving it up to our pastor, mm -hmm. or watching the internet for, for what Rod Henry might say, or what Ryan or Corey or Janice might say. It's getting into the Word of God, which is what this program does. Mm -hmm. We have seen personally, each one of us, and as a family, how the Word of God heals mm -hmm. and brings change and purpose. But if you're only reading it and you're not applying it to your life, then that's like me reading a, a book about gardening and dreaming about having a garden, but it never happens because I don't do those things to right. make the garden. Right. The same with our lives, mm -hmm. right? If we're just reading it, but we're not applying it, then nothing happens. Mm -hmm. And we don't become the ambassadors of Christ. Mm -hmm. We are not becoming a reflection of who He is, which is what our commission is mm -hmm. once we follow Christ. Our commission is to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we're not always going to get it right. There are weaknesses in our life. There, we, we see it here in Moses. We're going to see it, in, and as we read through, and, and we all fail. We mm -hmm. all fall, but that doesn't give us the excuse 
that it's okay to be like that. I'm the baby, gotta love me. There was a pro program that we used to yeah. watch when you, and that was a line thrown out all the time. I'm the baby, gotta love me. No, we need to, when we give our lives to Christ, desire with all of our hearts to live according to how he has called us to live. Mm -hmm. And some of that is hard to do, mm -hmm. but we don't do it on our own. We can't. That's why God sent his son, Jesus Christ. And you think that, you know, getting involved um, with the Bible means so much different than we are used to doing in this culture. You know, we look at things and we see things and we say, yeah, I need that, I need that, I want that, I want that. But hold on a minute. God wants us to do the things we read. So a lot of people are watching and uh, they need to do the things you read because we know that God tells us to share the good news. And with friends, do you have any friends? Do you have any family? I mean, this is what we do. We share the good news of Jesus Christ with them. If God the Father has changed you and helped you, you should tell somebody. And people say, well, I can't tell anybody. Well, can you talk to your friend? Can you talk to people about a good deal you got at a store? Well, a lot of people can do that. Well, why not tell them about a good deal you got for your life? Jesus Christ came into your life and helped you and healed you. I mean, we need to, we need to express ourselves that way. Not, you know, I vote for that or I vote for this or, you know, hold on. What is your story? Speak it and say it. That's what we should do. Very, very interesting. On the next program, we're gonna talk about God's parties from Leviticus 22 to 24. It's gonna be very interesting. You know, as a Christian, I wanna live my life like the Lord did. So I pray, and I pray today, join me in this prayer. Father, we pray that we would follow Jesus. We want to live our lives as you told us to. Help us to follow you every day. Help us to act and help us to react as you have taught us to. Because Lord, it's one thing to act like a Christian, but it's another thing to react like a Christian. Lord, change us. This is what we pray, amen.